Throughout my childhood, my family had a framed print on our wall of a 1940s painting by Lauren Ford. It was, of an, it was an image of a little girl, probably seven or eight years old, that incidentally looked a lot like me or one of my sisters. And she was walking through a tall forest filled with birds and forest critters of all kinds. And I read recently that Ford had been inspired by the woodlands of Connecticut, where she lived. And we lived in Colorado, so it's a nice poetic uh, rounding of the circle in my life. And looming large over this little girl in the painting was the faint image of a diaphanous guardian angel following closely and attentively behind her. This image became an indelible one for me, and it assured a lifelong sense that I had a guardian angel. I just didn't have the eyes to see it. We know well the iconic stories of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus, and then to Joseph warning him to flee with Mary and her baby to Egypt. But angels show up all throughout scripture from beginning to end, often escaping our notice. In the beginning, in the creation story, angels guard the gates of Eden where Adam and Eve are cast out. In Jacob's dream, which Jesus revisits significantly in today's gospel, angels ascend and descend upon a ladder between heaven and earth. When Daniel is thrown into a lion's den for worshiping the God of Israel, an angel comes to save Daniel from being torn apart. In an entertaining story from the book of Numbers, a wayward soothsayer named Bat Balaam is traveling down a road God does not want him on, and an angel of the Lord comes to block his way. Balaam's donkey lays down before the angel, unable to move. Balaam tries to beat his animal into submission until the donkey literally opens his mouth and says something like, for God's sake, man, there's an angel in the road. <laughs> Legions of angels attend Jesus' birth. Angels comfort Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They appear at the empty tomb. And in the book of Acts, squads of soldiers haul the apostle Peter into prison, only to have an angel come and break him free. In Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples never to dismiss a child because each one has an angel in heaven who sees the face of God. Again, Jesus invokes angels on the night he was arrested. Peter draws his sword to cut off the ear of a Roman soldier. And Jesus tells Peter that if living by the sword were the answer, God would send legions of angels to defend him. In the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, John describes a vision of the archangel Michael vanquishing Satan in a cosmic battle. Throughout, from beginning to end, angels capture the attention of the Bible characters they visit. They deliver messages about unseen realities, or all that might be, or could be, and sometimes that which should be and will be if people will just heed the angelic message. Now, today, Jesus has called dis disciples out of their ordinary lives in Galilee to follow him into a new way of life. And what does he do? He turns to that ancient story of Jacob's dream of angels ascending and descending on a ladder. In that story, when Jacob awakens from his dream, immediately he recognizes the holiness of that place where he felt heaven and earth come together and he builds an altar there. Jesus is clearly suggesting that he himself is the embodiment of that ladder, the point of union between the divine and human, between heaven and earth. And to follow him is to enter into the very real, <clears throat> yet unperceived traffic of holiness in the world. Upon coming to that place of seeing the holy, our hearts are cracked open and our imaginations are unleashed, and we can join in God's creative work of making God's holy world whole. In Celtic spirituality, a place where heaven and earth come together, where the spiritual meets the material, is called a thin place. And a thin place is holy for the simple reason that there is no separation between us and the divine. The incarnation of God in Jesus makes the whole cosmos a thin place, 
a holy union of earthly and divine. Angelic and human and creaturely are all intermingling and communing in one great harmony of praise in the presence of the living God. The theologian James Allison describes angels as being created by God in such a way that they oblige us to stretch our imaginations towards something of the extraordinary and unimagined diversity of beauties, of forms, of ways of being, which are completely beyond us. We too often get sidetracked by asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, or by speculating on what angels look like, or what kind of cosmic battles they're fighting on our behalf while we play and work and sleep. But the most important thing about angels are what they represent and what they have to say. Angel means messenger, and that is what they are. They are messengers and emissaries of God's overbrimming, absolutely creative vitality, which is present and available to us at all times. When we read the Bible stories about angels with close attention, we notice that angels appear mainly in times when we need them the most, in times of struggle and darkness, or when the need for a new way of imagining the world is most urgent. When the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke on August 28, 1963, at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, he brought a written speech which he had spent months preparing painstakingly together with his closest advisors to get the message just right. And indeed, his written imagery and turn of phrase were powerful and strong and specific. But there was no word dream in the speech he brought to the podium. This was a march for jobs, after all. King spoke about how America's black population had been issued a bad check from the accounts of justice and freedom, returned as, marked as insufficient funds, and 250,000 people were there that day to call America to live into its higher ideals of freedom, equality, and opportunity for all of its people. If King had simply delivered that speech as written and sat back down, school children across the land might be reciting lines about bad checks and insufficient funds when learning about this historic event of the Civil Rights Movement. But Mahalia Jackson, the queen of gospel and a dear friend of and collaborator with King, was sitting on the dais behind him. And she seized a momentary pause in King's remarks to call out to him, tell them about the dream, Martin, tell them about the dream. The dream was an image and theme that King had used many times in different speeches he had delivered across the South, and he had chosen to use a different theme on this day. But there in the moment, in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial, King listened to Jackson's spoken voice. Taylor Branch, who's the major chronicler of King's life and speeches, recounts in one of his books that when Mahalia Jackson was 14 years old, she had a vision of an angel who told her to open her mouth in God's name. And Jackson never wavered from that vision. She was the queen of gospel music with the singing voice of an angel. But on August 28, 1963, she opened her mouth to deliver a spoken angelic message Dr. King needed to hear. Her angelic message unleashed his imagination and inspired him to deliver his I Have a Dream speech spontaneously and off the cuff that continues to inspire us and shape our history 60 years later. Angels, our heavenly messengers, can come in many forms. The promise Jesus gives that we will see angels ascending and descending is not necessarily a promise that we will literally see winged angels with our own eyes, like the one in the painting I grew up with. But we, like Jacob, will see heaven and earth joined together more and more as we follow the way and life of Jesus. This path promises to stretch our imaginations toward the extraordinary possibilities that God whispers or shouts or challenges us to imagine.
most especially at times when there seem to be no answers and no way out of the dark and doom of our own and of our world's problems. We are all invited, just like Jesus' first disciples, to come and see what God can do when we agree to venture alongside Jesus down his path of love and risk having our imaginations stretched. When we follow his path, we will reach many forks in the road where one way might tempt us with the way of violence and physical force, and his way is the way of nonviolence and soul force, to borrow a phrase from our brother Martin. We will reach a fork in the road where one way reinforces our human categories of division and exclusion, and his way brings people together, points a way to healing, and makes communities whole. The roads we follow sometimes depend on the voices we listen to, the angels that speak for God or the voices that pose as God. Jesus promises we will see those better angels, the true messengers of love and peace and holiness that makes the world whole. May we all come and see these angels ascending and descending along his path we are called to follow and listen to them.